Ojibwe, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harm and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Many thanks to our partner, to our partners from Partner, Sari and Brandy. So we got some technical issues solved. I love, you know, spontane spontaneity and improvisation. Uh, thank you for your work. Without this, I think these events wouldn't happen. Vita. Our today's presenter responded to our request to send us a brief CV with a brief CV. We shared the short Vita online and it can be found on the many posters pinned on the walls in our building announcing his talk on a leap year on February 29th. If he would have sent us his full CV, we would notice it's full of achievements. One of the more recent is, for example, Prince Eugene or Eugen medal he received from the King of Sweden. He has taught at the, as a visiting professor at Harvard, among other universities. I feel very honored and more than pleased that Torbjorn Andersen didn't hesitate to accept our invitation for Food for Thought. I borrow a few words from Sars Presa Landesin, Torbjörn. Okay. Torbjörn is a renowned Swedish landscape architect. Besides designing, he also writes about landscape and our profession and teaches as a SLU in Ultuna, Sweden. His works are very rational, simple, but at the same time, very playful. He can work very successfully within various spatial scales and typologies from waterfronts, historic parks, cemeteries to campuses and corporate gardens. His passion are urban spaces, spaces where people socialize and negotiate. So I heard from Kamni and Fritz that they took our students when, where they, when they were in Europe uh, to Malmö, where they visited one of your projects, uh, uh, Torbjörn. It mm -hmm. was the Dania Park in Malmö. A short quote from a recent manifesto-like statement written by Torbjörn, quote, it has, it has been a very rapid journey from being someone who designs cozy parks with beautiful views, inviting seating, and a rich social life into being a climate in, in, in life being a climate engineer. I'm worried about these things, not only because they threaten the planet, but also because I'm not sure we can handle them. I must admit, I don't know how to do this. My office lacks the expertise. We were just talking about doubt and how to cultivate doubt uh, in our studio environment. Your office lacks experience. You can see, if you would see me, the question marks in my face. Is this just a lack of confidence or is this an expression of doubt in the plea for humbleness? Wo war this landscape architecture? Let's talk about sustainability. Please welcome Torbjörn Andersen. Okay, thank you, Dietmar. That was very kind of you. Um, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm looking forward to spend the next hour together with you, even if I would have preferred being there uh, on site, actually. It's an abstract experience, as we all know, with these uh, kind of, of uh, presentations. I am Torbjörn Andersson, a landscape architect educated mainly in Sweden many years ago. And as uh, Dietmar said, I was contacted by him uh, and he asked me if I would elaborate around that little short text that I wrote uh, some months earlier, which I thought would be fun and maybe interesting too. It was a really short text, maybe more of a pamphlet, uh, what we could say. 
So I'll start my PowerPoint now. Okay, so maybe some of you recognize this album cover because it is an album cover. It's a, we could see this guy sit in his Adirondack chair or whatever it is with his beach blanket and shades on, enjoying the moment while the world collapses around him. So this is a cover of an album by a, a British band called Super Tramp, not my favorite band, uh, but uh, extraordinary was that it was actually issued 50 years ago in 1975, and I was already then by hit by its cover. Maybe we can say that it was prophetic for where we are today. So the title of the text that we mentioned was uh, Let's Talk About Sustainability. And as uh, Dietmar said, I was asked by Landesen, which is a website about landscape architecture in Slovenia, with, with much wider ambitions than that and doing a great job, I must say. Uh, to I was asked by them to write a few chronicles about issues that I thought was important in our field of landscape architecture. And sustainability is by far the most important issue right now. Uh, and it has ambiguous consequences for landscape architecture that we are in, in this situation, I think. And the text that Dietmar was mentioning is only 16 rows long. So I might take a few minutes reading it to you. I think I jumped the first uh, three, four rows that Dietmar already read and jump in uh, right in here somewhere. Uh, the focus for landscape architecture is, nowadays is clearly sustainability. Design services are gone. Handling stormwater parks, heat islands, to fireproof grasses, taming the high winds, preventing river flooding, and sustaining bio biodiversity have taken its place. These are very difficult services that landscape architects are now asked to supply with. But we work with the biological systems and others expected to handle such questions. It has been a very rapid journey from being someone who designs cozy parks with beautiful views, inviting seating and a rich social life into being a climate engineer. I'm worried about these things. And now I come back to the quotings I think of Dittmar not only because they threaten the planet, but also because I'm not sure that we can handle them. I must admit, I don't know how to do this. My office lacks the expertise. Um, Dietmar touched on that as well. I am also not willing to be responsible for something that arrives from much higher levels. I read recently that the last G20 summit meeting which includes the 20 wealthiest countries in the world. Uh, they had a meeting in Switzerland, and the participants didn't agree on one single paragraph. Still, that is where these issues belong. CO2 emissions on a national level, coal mines in China and the USA, and wars. Come on, you guys. I can design well-attended parks, lively squares, and attractive waterfronts, but I have to say I'm sorry about not fixing the climate issue. So that was a little bit of a um, provocative uh, uh, saying, maybe. And uh, uh, to and, and since Dietmar asked me to, to talk about these things a little bit, or maybe develop it, I have prepared 19 slides that I thought of showing you today. And they are divided in three sections. Uh, first Bion, section. Bion, yes. Just a second, if you don't mind, could you yeah. try to share full screen with us? Okay. Of course. Sorry. Yeah. There we go, right? Not yet. Okay. Because we received an email, I think a, a note from Mark Tribe as well. He's joining us, probably from California. He would okay. like to see the full picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Mark. Always supportive. <laughs> Can you try it again, probably, on your side? 
Yeah. It's um sorry for interrupting. You might have to stop your screen share, then turn the presentation on and then share again. Okay. Uh you know. Um Still nothing there. Same screen. We see like the whole PowerPoint. Okay. So I stop sharing, right? And try to get it from the beginning again, maybe. It oh, there we go. Now you've stopped sharing. So we just okay. see you. Mm -hmm. And then I'll start sharing again, right? Yeah. And um okay. Does that work? No. Same thing. We're seeing the whole PowerPoint. If you if you stop the share, yes, and then put it into presentation mode in PowerPoint, and then start the share again, that might let us see the full screen. Okay. So I. Try to well, I'm not sure how to do this really. So Well, I'm fighting here, but I'm not succeeding. I think frankly. we have a we have a suggestion from Mark. Okay. He says, Select start slideshow or the Swedish equivalent. It's the icon that looks like a wine glass. <laughs> okay. Um. No, I'm nope. not succeeding. Okay. If, uh, you, if you just want to go back to the uh, the screen as it was, we could even zoom in a little bit if that works, just so it's a bit okay. bigger. I'll, and, I'll, 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 I'm clicking once more on the wine glass now. Sure. Did that work? We just see you. We don't see your screen. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you have to share your screen after you put it into the presentation. Mm -hmm. so um, sorry, I see both Torbjörn and the uh, presentation, but it seems to toggle in between. So when Torbjörn speaks, I see his face, but when there is a pause, I see the screen. So maybe one option is to turn off the video and we can see the presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't really know what to do now, actually. It's, uh, maybe I'm not even sharing anymore. Yeah, I don't see the share. It doesn't seem like you're sharing your screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so just, just share as you were originally, as long as we can get something up there, that's good. No. You, you can send no. it to Mark later. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There we go. Okay. So do we have at least something there? <laughs> we do we do see the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Is that good enough? That'll be good enough. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, you guys. So um I have 19 slides to to share with you, and they're divided into three sections. And the first section is a couple of slides which uh describes confusion surrounding the development of the origins of the profession as well as the academia, the word landscape that that would be. Uh, and these confusions that has irritated me for many years are good to be aware of, I think. The second section 
are six slides showing the development of landscape architecture within the, the university world uh, in my country, described in, in six phases. Uh, and admittedly, Sweden is a very small and remote country from your horizon, horizon especially, but I think there are some evident parallels here with, between Canada and Sweden, and both sides could learn from making comparisons. So I will describe very swiftly uh, how landscape architecture as an academic field came, came about. Um, right, and the third section finally will be six concerns that I have uh, regarding the first two sections and relating to the pamphlet, let's talk about sustainability. And then maybe at the very end, we could have a discussion about these things. I tried to uh, learn a little bit about the Canadian circumstances. And I learned that Canada has 24 programs in landscape architecture at 12 universities. Toronto, Manitoba are among those, of course. Guelph seemed to have the oldest one dating from the 1960s, or am I wrong, maybe? The Guelphers say that they have the longest tradition in the province, but I'm not sure what a province is. Is all of Canada a province? Is land a province? Is landscape a province? Or does Canada consist of several provinces, like British Columbia and so forth? So part of our problem, I think, is right there. It was the land surveyors who colonized and defined quite a major part of not only the factual landscape, but also the concept of landscape. Just as a comparison to that, Sweden has its, had its first program launched in 1972. Today, we have two locations. The first school all over the world, I have understood, was Harvard GSD, and that was more than 100 years ago. OK, so we should be going. Um, OK, so now my uh, doesn't seem like. It's moving forward for some reason. Yeah, yeah it moves. It does? OK, good. So it's something of a journey, uh, we could say. And uh, the first one that I wanted to um, uh, show you, the first slide, is uh, just listing a few landscape definitions. Maybe the third one of those are the most uh, common one, at least in Europe, that landscape is a land arranged for human presence. There's one problem about the fourth one, landscape versus urbanity. And these are mostly linguistic problems. So in Sweden, landscape relates to nature. And it's a dichotomy, as we say, with a fancy word to, together with urbanity. So landscape is related to nature and has nothing to do with uh, cityscapes or landscapes in the city, which, which makes the understanding of the concept uh, more difficult for us. Uh, we also have something that is called the European Landscape Convention that you might have heard of. It was a charter that was signed some eight, 10 years ago called the Florence Charter, where all most European countries was trying, were trying to agree on what is landscape. And the answer they came up with was landscape is how land is perceived by its people, which sounds like a silly argument maybe because it goes in a circle, but it indicates that they, in this Florence charter, define landscape as uh, something which has a social presence of, of the people, of course. And then maybe finally in this row are the old uh, definition of landscape that uh, Pliny the Younger had 2000 years ago in first, second and third nature, first being the garden, second being the cultivated land, and third being the wild nature of which we have almost nothing uh, anymore. And this was uh, taken up in the uh, 20th century by uh, uh, historian John Dixon Hunt at University of Philadelphia. So those were a, a few things that uh, 
has confu have confused at least me. Uh, the second image is about the professionalizing of landscape architecture. Um, in many ways, and, and it's in, I written there in search for a profession profession lost in translation, uh, which has to do with this difference of the, the word landscape in many European languages as opposed to um, to uh, English. Uh, it's also an issue of scale. Um, Sweden, for instance, has a number of provinces, I think is the word that you're using, 25 of them. And they are not called provinces, they are called landscapes. So that makes it really difficult because when somebody asks you what your profession is and you tell them you're a landscape architect, they would say, okay, so which landscape did you design? Was it Wyoming or was it British Columbia? So it's. I always thought that we should rename the profession of landscape architecture. It has a nomenclature which is quite confusing. But we know uh, generally that uh, Frederick Law Olmsted in the United States was one of the first. Uh, and I have read that he was also very influence, influential in Canada uh, and um, had the disciples going to your country, maybe beginning there uh, before your own, uh, uh, your own uh, professional group was developed. We had uh, somebody called Sven Hermelin in the 1930s. That was before the education was started, but he got his education elsewhere. We had one famous uh, and very productive person called Holger Blum in the 1940s. And they got their education uh, initially in Germany. And then after the, the Second World War, people would go to England primarily before, before the starting of our old program, which was like a, a, a little pod in the 1960s, but was official first in the beginning of the 1970s. So that might uh, work as a prologue, we could say. We have, we're dealing with a, a field of knowledge uh, that arrives from the garden, from horticulture. Um, we're dealing with a field that lacks an academic tradition, at least in Sweden. Um, it was a craft and people were educated at the uh, colleges rather than universities. And in Sweden, we're also dealing with uh, uh, education that is situated at the University of Agriculture which is quite common in Europe, whereas it would probably be much better if it was situated somewhere where they could cooperate with the, 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 the faculties of architecture and, and urban planning. But that's not the, uh, the, the, the idea so far. Um, and uh, we're stuck with that somehow. And the reason is that the uh, universities of agriculture, they deal with water, um, soil, and um, vegetation, of course. So that uh, would be a, a good move, the initiator's thought. And uh, now over to the second section. So I have those six phases I wanted to describe to you. I imagine when in the 70s, when, when the program committees sat down, they would uh, try to list what kind of things do we have to teach the, 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 the landscape architect? So these were lots and lots of things, hydrology, geology, history, meteorology, zoology, land survey, and all those things that I listed on the bottom rows there. And they floated around. Not all of these things were even situated at the University of Agriculture. So it was a very cloudy and diffuse uh, situation where uh, nobody really knew what we were aiming at and maybe didn't even hadn't even defined what a landscape architect does. So the second phase, and this was when I went to school in the 70s, mid 70s, we had to move to other places where they had those uh, uh, competences. So I call that the nomadic phase. To learn botany, we had to go to the University of Uppsala, where they have uh, departments of botany. To learn geology, we had to go to the Technical Institute in Stockholm, where they teach those things, and so on and so on. So 
it was a, a definition of the subject by separate parts, which made it very much into a collage. And important also was that research and development of these things happened at other places and not our own school. Are you there? <laughs> Good. Okay. So this, the, the third phase, uh, I call the colonial uh, <laughs> phase, because we imported teachers from these places to our schools. Now at least they were assembled at the same place. The history people, the planning people, the hydra hyd hydrology people, and so forth the design people, the botany people, and they were assembled at our school, but that was not where they belonged. So they were um, colonizing our department, which still didn't really have a have a core. Uh, the, the fourth phase I'd call interdisciplinary, and that's a word that I was very ambiguous about because it's a way to try to say that our identity is that we are interdisciplinary. Um, so it's a definition through cross conduits connecting various uh, fields. And it means that we still lack a core of sorts, but it's more defined by uh, a mosaic of different uh, fields of knowledge that are supposed to connect with each other. So that was probably um, in the end of the 70s in Sweden, I would say. The fifth phase was disciplinary. Finally, we had people um, teaching landscape architecture. We had real, la authentic landscape architects employed at the department that had that background themselves. So landscape architecture is now defined as a discipline in its own right. So I would say this was probably a happy time in many, in many years, in many, many ways. The sixth phase, which is probably where we are now, it's ex the expansion phase. And it means that the core that we were happy about is beginning to draw orbits out in the periphery. We, we do discover new territories, landscape urbanism, ecological urbanism, urban design, and different climate catastrophe issues. So this is probably necessary, but it, it throws the field into a, um, into a uh, situation where we, we, we are not sure about the boundaries, but that's, and as everything, that's, that's both good and bad actually. Um, but uh, it's clearly so that the landscape architecture competence now is almost vaguer than than uh, in, uh, than ever because it's uh, taking within its umbrella things that we didn't touch on before. And that was what I tried to describe in that little pamphlet that we that we began with, actually. Okay, so now we're into the uh, the final. <laughs> Uh, third, actually, which it's uh, six concerns. Uh, these are not the only ones, of course. These are quite uh, loosely formulated, but uh, we might have a discussion afterwards and come up with some more of these. But there are some things that are really concerning, and some of them are more important than the others. But all of them are important to our profession, I think. So the first concern is that climate change, as it is today, is uh, a defined threat to the planet. And this is common knowledge, we could say, but it's not accepted knowledge everywhere. The guy in the Adirondack chair on the opening slide is not aware. Many politicians are not aware. Many countries are not aware. And it's also, it's a sort of a dialogue or a, a, a conflict between in some ways, East and West, in some ways, young and old, in some well, ways, left and right. So it's it's a lot of interesting uh, uh, point of departures that, that collide here, I think, about the discussion about the how important in it, is it really about the climate threat, not least in the country which uh, is situated south of you, of course. So the second uh, 
concern, um, I call it sustainability loses its content. Um, I think when sustainability began uh, in the 60s, we called it ecology. It's not the same thing, but it was the same kind of thinking, sort of red alert, what are we doing to the world? Um, little by little, uh, sustainability and the word connected to that, like uh, uh, biodiversity, like uh, um, uh, all, all kinds of associated words that we use frequently nowadays are so frequently used that so they're used in the wrong contexts. FedEx and DHL, they circle around the planet with big airplanes carrying small parcels and call what they're doing green transport. So they're stealing the concept away from where it belongs. And we know that these, th these things are, are actually not true. So uh, it's a problem, uh, I think, that sustainability is used in such a careless way. And it use, its use is as a excuse for almost anything uh, these days so that means it's getting to be a word without content and without meaning which is a big problem so we have to kind of uh, kidnap those concepts back to where they belong in in the in the area of serious uh, uh, consciousness i think uh, the third concern is something that i Called the landscape architect is being reduced to an environmental engineer. And that comes out of, Dietmar touched on that as well, and it comes out of uh, the situation where um, we solve everything with uh, engineering these days. Uh, as I tried to, to, to say in that text, we lose our creative mind in design and we lose our ability, maybe not lose, but we can't do it anymore because we, because we, we're, uh, we are busy enough doing uh, stormwater parks, which is basically a swamp, you know, instead of making a dry place where you have a good view. So landscape architects have to be aware of the fact that we do have a, a competence that we should guard um, and we are currently at least in Sweden asked to do services that we're not fully trained for and um, it's a confusion there that we're still asked to do it I think part of the problem is actually began with Al Gore you know the vice president of the United States that had this movie made called an unconvenient truth uh, some of you saw that. It was graphically very um, enchanting, I would say. And uh, he would point his finger towards the viewer and saying, and this is your responsibility and your and your. So he was bringing out these very important issues of his to the individuals. And uh, that's the way it is in Sweden still. You know, I, I, it's very good that individuals try to take that uh, responsibility. But as long as the G20 meetings can't uh, agree on anything, we will not be able to change our lifestyle, which is uh, uh, what, what it uh, fundamentally is about, of course. Okay, so the fourth... Um, concern that I have at least um, that we have in Sweden, I don't know how it is in Canada is that formulas and calculations replace complex knowledge. There are all kinds of charts and Excel sheets that the landscape architect is asked to fill in. How many species do you have? How many percentage of wetland do you have? All kinds of fragmented expertise are asked for and it threatens to substitute the synth synthesizing and complex knowledge which is the hard point of our profession and also our uh, teaching and research in academia and this in part has to do with uh, 
the digital revolution, I think, because everything is known now, everything can be found. So, and the, but it can't really be discussed because it's a one way type of communication. So that uh, forces the discussion to um, drift away in a direction of trying to put down all important things in figures and in formulas. So in Sweden, for instance, if you, there's something called the green, green point scheme. So you get green point, you get points if you have more than so and so many trees and more and so and so many of this, many of this and that. And if you if you add that up, you end up to 25 points or something, and then it's okay. And then you get uh, favorable loans from the government, for instance. So it's a it's a way to um, direct these things, which I think is not accurate enough, actually. And they even have, it's it's also banal. They also have something called gold, silver, and bronze levels, oh, especially for architecture. If you use little concrete and lots of wood, which is really good, but it it's not as simple as that. You can get even a gold level of what you do and you can get prices and everything. It's it's trivia, really. It's uh, We're leaving the serious discussion, I think. Okay. And then... Um, uh, so that was the fourth. So I have four more to go. Um, one other thing that we might, we, we should guard and safeguard, and um, which is important. And it was, it's to me, one of the core qualities of our profession is uh, livability, uh, which is a spooky word, I agree. But uh, the, the qualities of living in the urban realm uh, and also social, quali social qualities they run the risk of being left behind when we try to focus too hard on stormwater parks and to fireproof the grasses. Um, those other values are washed away. And uh, we're better than that, I think. We should be able to do both. Okay, and the sixth uh, concern that I have is actually the it's uh, the abdication of experts, and it has to do with the digital age also. Um, as we mentioned, the digital age makes everything accessible for everyone. Internet is a giant billboard. Expertise is grinded down in this maelstrom of info. So um, experts are hidden between the, the 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 waves of information that that comes over us when we try to look for things on the internet which is a, a problem the experts have to take a bigger responsibility and say their their uh, their research and tell tell it tell it out so that it can be used instead of um, everyone being an expert. I th I'm sure you have that phenomenon too. It's maybe it's clear in the uh, uh, medical world with, with the doctors or physicians, for instance, where the patients arrive and they have Googled that uh, you don't have to examine me because I have already Googled and I'll be okay if you could just give me a recipe of this medicine, which makes the uh, phys ph physicist crazy, of course. and. Uh, uh, try to fight back their their competence uh, in which they could uh, help the um, the citizens. So uh, those are the six concerns that I uh, formulated, and there could be six more and maybe twenty more. But I think it's important that we do these things. Um, it's uh, to try to problematize where we are, because it's such a, um, a confusing time now with so many things happen simultaneously. And we have to use our competence to try to be clear about what is our uh, standpoint in, in the uh, climate uh, uh, catastrophe issues. OK. Um, crisis, what crisis? was the uh, title of that album cover that I showed you first with a man in the uh, Adirondack chair 
asking uh, about what this this crisis about really um i think uh, being critical being doubtful and having the bravery should come from academia that is our role at the universities it's our role to question to go in depth to criticize it is the responsibility of the academic institutions and has always been actually and in the era of Anthropocene, it's more important than ever. I'll stop with one slide of the park that Dietmar Yu mentioned that your colleagues had actually visited in the southern part of Sweden in the city of Malmö uh, that we designed in my office. And uh, I hope that by showing this, it can address, address some of these issues and also maybe uh, uh, a way forward. So this park is a seafront park. It's located on landfill that you can tell by the boulder lining that holds the mud in place, holds the landfill in place. This boulder lining was already there before we uh, started to design there. The sea was there. On the other side, you can see Denmark, not in this image, but a little bit more to the south. So it's the strait between Sweden and Denmark, actually. Um, if the sea hadn't been there, it would have been a very expensive park to, to do, needless to say. The horizon was there. The big sky was there. There is a park actually here also, it's the size of two football fields, and it's located outside the right frame of the image. But what is the main, main sensation of the park is what you see here. And most of these things were already there, and they are for free. But we made a few gestures that dramatized that setting. And that is what we did, and that mode of working I hope can be a, a way to a more sustainable future. Okay, thank you. That was it. <laughs> I should. Oh, I take those. Yep, yeah, I'll turn your camera on so you can chat with them. So thank you very much, Torbjörn. Thank you. As always, very inspiring, provocative, makes us thinking. So, I hope so. <laughs> thank you very much for always being, you know, fully engaged in our world of thinking and professionalism and education with your publications and your uh, uh, projects. So, we will open up the floor for questions. And if there are questions or comments in the chat room, please don't hesitate to type them or unmute and just start to ask the question. Here, it's a comment. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. So are there questions? Uh, first of all, no, but I really liked, how many sleepless nights did you spend in order to produce these sketches, you know, to communicate, to communicate complex thoughts through simple sketches. Because that's something we always try to encourage us in our studios, you know, take your pen and your hand in order to articulate your thoughts. That was wonderful, you know, the sketches at the very beginning. And you know, I, you seem you seem to be a master. I, do you know how to make schnapps? Uh, I know how to drink schnapps. <laughs> you don't, but that's good if you enjoy schnapps. But that's the art. I, I think it was almost like schnapps producing and making schnapps. You no know, okay. process of distillation in order to get to the ess essence of something. Okay. You no, know, to yeah. point it out. To have six points, I would actually maybe add a seven point, you know, what I experience here. I think imagination is one of our strongest tools and skills. And I yeah. think policies 
and standards and guidelines sometimes right. have the ability to kill our creativity. Hmm. So again, thank you very much for this presentation. Hmm. And are there questions? Yeah, can can I comment on what you said, uh, Dietmar, a little bit? It's um, um, thank you for saying that. And you you said how many how much time did you did you spend in trying to get those uh, things in order? If I at all got it in order, and um, there there's this R uh, Romanian sculptor Brancusi. You might know of him, a European Brancusi. He's a really interesting sculptor. He died thirty years ago. He said that. The difficult thing is not to do the work. The difficult thing is to get in the mode to do the work. So I think you're on the point there, Dietmar. You have to reflect and train to think and reflect first and then do when you're in the mode to do the work. So to, to get to do statements, um, if they're good or bad, it requires something of a thinking process. It's not something that you find on Google or on the internet. It, it As you're saying, it, it requires an engagement in, in these issues. And uh, you know, one simple trick that, that I uh, often use, uh, that Mark Tribe, who is attending, which I'm happy about because he's my mentor, we could say, uh, is that I often use numbers. And I think I learned that from Bob Dylan, actually. He always had these um, six riders towards the horizon or whatever it is. And uh, um, having these numbers is a didactic trick, I think, because people say, okay, so it says number three. See now, what can number four be? So that was that should be a, a little hint that I could give you if you, if you didn't uh, discover that already that uh, use number a lot, that that really helps and it, it makes people more attentive. Okay. But give yourself time to think if you want to conclude something. Nobody can just bring it yeah. out like that. Mm -hmm. So we received a question in the chat room. Rachel, Sarah, Alpron, do you want me to read your question? So I don't hear anything. So yeah, yes, please. So question for you, Torbjörn. Okay. Can you talk about any examples of projects that utilize traditional landscape focuses while also employing environmental engineering? Yeah. It's uh yeah, it's an interesting question. Of course, it's a little hazardous because traditional is a, <laughs> a word that um Almost nobody wants to, um, except for the new urbanists, would like to uh, confess to, so to say. But I see what you're saying. How do we combine what we are um, trained to do? Uh, of course, you could choose different tracks, but being, let's say, being a landscape designer with the climate uh, catastrophe. And if I know any projects that do that, I do think that we are approaching that more and more. For instance, in Sweden, I'm sure in Canada too, we have uh, a daywater uh, pipe system that is 100 years old. We don't use it anymore. We bring the storm water down into the ground where it belongs to give give uh, nutrition to the to the vegetation instead. So that that's a big uh, change in the engineering, infrastructural engineering, of course. Um, we do also, we, we're not planting um, 500 lindens as they did in the French Baroque. We, pla we, pla we have a much bigger variety. We have a much better knowledge about uh, soils. So I, I'd say that over the world, so many trees that I have seen that grow have grown one foot in 25 years. But now we have knowledge about soil issues. So there's a lot of technical things that we have learned about, but I understand that you want uh, examples of, of concrete uh, projects. And um, well, there, there's a, 
it, 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 this is a good, good opening for a thesis of some sort. I think it, there's, we do have really cutting edge, high technology these days uh, to, to see. For instance, the Ground Zero Monument on Southern Manhattan in the United States that Peter Walker designed most, uh, to, to, to most part, is a absolutely uh, top knowledge system of technical issues underground. And then we have the other side of, of that coin is to just work really subtly and not doing too heavy infrastructural uh, bandages on the sore, but rather try to make nature um, re relate to it itself. Um, so that's at least one project that I mentioned, but I, I do think that there's uh, many other projects. I think the sign of the time is to work more with nature, of course, which Ian McCaw expressed 50 years ago, but this is a different way of working with nature when we're working with na natural processes that are self-repairing uh, in, in a much higher way than the high-tech uh, solutions. I don't know if that's a good question to your answer there, but it's an effort, at least. Thank you. I would like to encourage you the floor. Hey, students, colleagues, questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'm not sure if I fully formulated this question, but I think that there's some uh, some content there that uh, you can respond to. You trace the interdisciplinary history of landscape architecture and at the same time highlighted the risk of practitioners losing the ability to consider complex knowledge, which seems to be linked to a universal trend in many disciplines away from generalization and towards uh, specialization. So given this interdisciplinary history of landscape architecture, do you think that landscape architects are uniquely positioned to address the climate crisis, or is it a more general call to all disciplines that uh, we need to have more general approach to both theory and practice? Okay, thank you. Dietmar, either uh, you could help me out with trying to repeat some of the major things in the question, or I'll just take a chance and try to guess what the question was about because the sound was not so clear here actually w would you like to clarify a little bit after what you heard it mark okay. okay uh in the meantime let me let me do a wild guess what the question was about i think that the landscape architecture is not science everything that is science should uh make a red alert because science is evidence. Uh, there has to be e evidence founded as we know. And um, it, it brings in a very narrow per perspective on, 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 on the problem that you're trying to cope with. So I think that landscape architecture needs to be most of all, both, uh, grounded in science but not too much I mean, creativity i think is has in its definition that it's an ability of trying to combine different uh, facts or opinions or whatever your input is uh, and to combine it into a new reality so i think that landscape architects that rely too much on science um, um, is in trouble you know, it's, it's easy to compare between a, a psychiatrist, which is a medical doctor, basically, with a psychologist that has a completely different education, and to ask them the same questions. And you will realize that the psychiatrist is much more based in, in, in science than the psychologist is. And that's the same with landscape architecture. 
Um, and that's a problem for research within landscape design because research has a quite strict model how it should be done. And um, it, it also moves along narrow paths, of course. And uh, it, it threatens to make the uh, answers more trivial or more, more, um, more directed in one, just one direction than it should be. So I think also at the uh, universities, uh, it, science has to be discussed. Uh, this evidence base that at least in Sweden, now everything that we say, they say, is that evidence based? Can you show me a source on that? It's very hard to mirror, reflect that into the world of, of uh, a creative design, for instance. Did I miss your question completely? I apologize in that case because the the sound was uh, very unclear here at my side. I guess the, the, the two main points um, were just this shift from generalization to specialization um, and the danger within landscape architecture, but also I think in many other disciplines. Uh, and then with this interdisciplinary history, uh, of landscapes, um, does that uh, put landscape architects in a unique position to uh, address the climate crises, but interconnected crises as well? Yeah, I see. I, I don't think it's a unique position. I think the whole society goes in those drains these days. It's There's a discussion in Sweden now about the uh, the the old discussion about if environment or or heritage defines uh, your personality and how much you can change it or 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 do anything about it in the first place, uh, and of course uh, the answer must be after what I have understood that it's both, and that goes for all kinds of science. That science need to be having a broader view. But the problem with interdisciplinary, as I touched on, I think, is that there's no core there. Um, if everything is just interdisciplinary and it's uh, made out of conduits between the different disciplines, then we lose the core. So I think landscape architects, we need to have a core. That core doesn't have to be the same. A landscape planner has a different core than a landscape designer. I'm more of a designer, I would say. Uh, somebody that, uh, well, there's all kinds of cores that we can have, but I think it's important for also for you students, but you're, you're young so far, so you have time, but search for your core and then try to look at the science. That, that would be a, a recommendation, I think. So th <laughs> that was the second guess. I don't know if that better answered your, your question. No, I see this more as a discourse for the question and answer. Do you want to ask for something? Please go ahead. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Say you. Dr. There's a question in the chat. Sorry. Okay. I'll read this one out. So this is from Dave Penner. He asked. Yeah, that, that, thank you, Brandy. That's much better. I hear you much, much better. Perfect. Okay. So do you think that our current university programs are citing to change landscape architecture to primarily address climate change? Do you think that the do you think that this will mean the end of landscape architecture as you understand it because it is such a new discipline are you concerned about this? Yeah, I think so that's I think uh, why I wrote this little pamphlet uh, I don't think that'll happen. I try to be a little bit dramatic about these things, but I uh, I think it's a jeopardy if we uh, only um, only relate to the climate issues. And again, I don't think we have the full competence. I think the problem is not really in our hands. That sounds uh, not very responsibility minded, maybe, but. We do have to change our lifestyles to really change uh, the CO2 emissions, for instance. We know about this, and it doesn't matter so much if individuals try to do their best because it's a structural, uh, political 
level where this belongs and it has to be taken from there. So, but as you're saying, I know that in Gothenburg in Sweden, for instance, they re they're remaking the training for architects into a sustainable education and it might be really good, but you have to look out to, to watch out so that we don't lose the design issues. Design, what design makes to us as, as people is maybe soft value and it's harder to define, but I'm I'm sure we all are, per, are are confident about that. It is important. So it's important that we don't uh, flush th those values out, but to it's, it's sort of a panic um, situation in the world right now, I think. It's uh, more than half of the countries in the world are not democracies. There's a few wars going on, really major wars. There's a, a, a distance taken between Russia and Europe here, in, for instance. There's it's troublesome relations with, we have troublesome relations with, with China. Uh, and all those things really uh, is making me scared, and most people scared, I think, that we could lose something that is more important than the landscape architecture education. But I think that the landscape architecture education clearly is at stake as well. But then again, change is always good. You know, change uh, means that we adapt to new circumstances. So it's we have to do both things. You know, we have to try to uh, conserve, conserve is not a good word, to retain the knowledge that we have, but to renew it according to the new situations that we have. Um, so it's, as always, answers are, we have to do both or. So, uh, it's important to uh, be open-minded and to uh, reflect, as we said uh, some minutes ago here. Is that an answer to the question? Somehow. Hey, thanks for being for you. Does this answer your question? Don't hear anything. So I take this as an agreement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now um, maybe room for one more, more question. For time for one more question the, from the audience. So it's very sunny. I like your notion you know, when, when you started that we had maybe you have to act fast in the role of academia or the role of academia. Oh, there's one more question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll read this. I'll read this last one out and then I think that'll probably be time. Okay, thank you, Brandy. So the question is, we were trying to develop a sustainability toolkit for our practice. If toolkits are not the answer, then what is? Mm. Um, that is the question, right? Yeah, I think toolkits are good for how to learn how to use a drilling machine or how to make a cake. But uh, being a landscape architect, uh, uh, a toolkit is too simple. It's uh, we have to be able to do several things at, at once and to think more than one thought. And uh, that's what I was trying to touch on and the concerns that if we simplify these issues too much and even make, make them into matrices, um, then I think we're missing the point. Um, I think it's good uh, to try to develop toolkits if you do it with, with concern and with the... Uh, uh, consciousness of that uh, reality is seldom so simple. So um, I think speed is difficult in uh, com common life nowadays that everything has to happen so fast uh, so that we run for quick solutions which are not uh, being uh, uh, tested enough and uh, uh, maybe are not safe enough to, to use. So uh, I'm a little bit, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit allergic to, to toolkits because it sounds like what a toolkit originally is, which is a simple instruction how to uh, uh, solve a, a simple problem. But maybe I'm un unfair. Okay. 
Okay. I would the term stadium program <laughs> with toolkits and policies and standards. In my opinion, each each case is a specific case, and we have to respond to those cases. Yeah. So I'm always uh, concerned about yeah. toolkits like that. So I agree yeah. with does this answer the question? No, to the toolkits, that's okay, that's satisfying. Yes. No. Yeah, so, I think in, in, in our also in our field, uh, we went through this period in the 60s, I would say, that developed standards and rules and regulations. And, you know, during the modernist years, the architects were seen wearing white robes like doctors or something, walking around. And, and when Marcel Breuer designed this famous chair of his at after Bauhaus, he said that this is the best chair ever. Nobody has to think about chairs anymore because this is the definite chair. So to, to this complex subject that landscape architecture is, I think it's important to, to not fall down in the 60s where we really were longing for those regulations and standards. So if we um, design after regulations and standards, I think we're in 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 problem actually. So thank you. So program. So at all times, students have to go back into classes, design studios. Okay. Got to learn how to develop <laughs> toolkits. Uh, here thank was you. thank you from Vancouver that tells you no. Thank you from other other provinces here in Canada. So your talk was widespread all over the land here, which is great. Nava, thank you for the wonderful talk. I just can agree and I don't have or want to add anything to that. So if you don't mind, if you don't mind, maybe an applause for Tokyo. And thank you so much, Dora. Yeah. Okay. Your, I guess yeah, it's right. dark at your place. You are seven, seven hours ahead of us. Yes. In your landscape. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, thank you, students, and if there's teachers and other people for attending. It's um, difficult with this abstract kind of uh, um, dialogue, but it is what it is. And uh, I hope that something uh, made a mark somehow that can be usable for you and good luck in your future um, and good luck Dietmar and uh, Sari and uh, Brandy um, at the school of uh, University of Manitoba, Manitoba and thank you for inviting me. You keep on going, you know, keep on going to publish your provocative short pieces that's very inspiring. Okay. So thank you very much, Tobion, and yeah. the audience for your patience and attention. Okay. Yeah, bye for now. Bye. Okay, bye bye now. Bye.